Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Hoffman. I'm Executive Director of Technology for Clover School District. And to my left is Andy Cobble, our mobile device engineer. Um, I guess I want to start out by um, kind of going over what we're going to talk about today. So um, first, I'm going to tell you who we are, who Clover School District is. Um, we're going to talk about why we did what we did, why we chose to go one-to-one, -one, um, and what that process looked like. Um, then we're going to tell you how we actually accomplished it over the past four years. Um, and then what did we learn? Because it is the pains and possibilities of one-to-one. -one. Not an easy process, but a very rich learning process. So who is Clover School District? Well, we have, as of last week, right under 7,600 students spanning across seven elementary schools, two middle schools, one high school and one alternative school. And as you can see by the image, that's Charlotte, North Carolina, and their school district. And we're the little guy down in the corner, um, just to kind of show what we look like. Um, but that's our layout of our school district. Um, we also, this is how our middle schools are split. So you see we have a very, um, one large half of the district, one tiny half of the district, but in population, they're almost identical. Um, so we have a very rural area and then a kind of a lakeside community that feeds Charlotte. Um, but to service this, we have eight technicians, we have four engineers, an executive director, an educational technology director, three district tech coaches, and seven school level tech coaches. And don't be confused with tech coaches, these are not lab assistants. These are truly dedicated tech coaches for integrating technology. So why? Why technology and education? Um, with, in Clover, we want to create a seamless, personalized instruction. So I have a little graphic here. I have no idea who did this, and in fact cited that artist unknown. Um, but it's a teacher saying, for fair selection, everybody please has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And you can see in today's educational society that, that you can't measure all students with the same standard. You can't expect all students to learn in the same way. So that's where our technology and one-to-one -one has come into play. Um, so we try to create an environment of active learning for all students. Um, create a culture for risk-taking, allowing your students to fail, allowing your devices to fail and your teachers to fail so that we can learn from that. Um, creating a relevance and engagement so the different products that we have on our iPads and MacBooks are truly tailor-made for each student. Um, including our relationship with eSpark, who just walked in the door. Um, so um, we have that for all of our iPad students. Um, and then with these devices, I mean, we get a lot of data. So we have a dedicated data engineer that aggregates all that data and helps us drive instruction. So time for a little bit of philosophy about Clover. Why are we one-to-one? -one? Um, Clover's one-to-one -to, -one to connect students to lead and what that means for Clover is teaching students to learn real problems, engineer real solutions, analyze live feedback, and design tomorrow. This is the theme and model for Clover's one-to-one -one initiative in our direction moving forward with instruction. So how do you deploy 7,500 devices? Before we talk about that, Matt, we need to talk about collection. That's true, yeah. So really, when you go one-to-one, -one, you only deploy once for the first time, right? That's the whole, just because it's the first time. Um, after that, you've really got to think about when you collect your devices, what that next fall is going to look like. Because if you collect wrong, which I'm about to show you what that looks like, um, you're not going to be able to deploy as easily. So first, I'm going to go to our high school where we did it right the first time. And we thought, who sees a lot of people every day in a narrow space. Well, I've already been through them once this week, I'm going through them again today, and that's the TSA. So what we did was we set up our media center, and we created rows, columns that were clearly identified. If you'll see here, we have white and black markers on the floor, and you can't see the blue marker in front of the table closest to us. But each of these lines, as the students entered the media center, they were told, your grade level is this colored line, please follow it. As they went through, every station had two dedicated people to collect device, identify the student, inspect it, and then categorize it and store it. 
you'll see we have milk crates lining all of our tables and they're all blue. But on each milk crate is a color coded tag by grade level so that when we're getting these 2,000 plus iPads, well, 2,400 iPads, MacBooks, I'm sorry, MacBooks at our high school, um, we can keep track of them in transit and keep them by grade level. Um, we also had very personalized situations where we were face to face with each student and really going through um, what was going on with their devices. And we had one station all the way in the very back. You can barely see that we had an asset tag printer and any problem items that came through, we tried to take care of them on the fly. That way in the summer, we're not overwhelmed with all the little mini situations that come up during the collection. And just trying to find them, like if you flag something as damaged on collection and then frantically stow it away, you've got to find it during the summer wherever you store, if you're centralized or decentralized, just finding it before you hand that broken device back out. So let's talk about our elementary and middle school device collections. So earlier I mentioned that we had three district level coaches and seven school level coaches. So at all of our elementary schools, their coaches are controlled by their principals. I can give them recommendations, I can give them guidance, but I can't tell them what to do. So the uh, actual collection was designed by the tech coach. They got to design it however their school wanted to do it, whether it was let's go to each classroom and collect in the classroom, let's bring the kids to one location, let's put it all on the teachers. Those are all examples of different ways that actually happened. Um, very few directions were given from us. We basically said, we want all of your iPads 100% in our crates and centrally collected so that we can pick them up and take them back to our warehouse. We did tell them that there's a level of acceptable loss, like the charging cables. I'm actually saying don't collect them at all because if you've done this before and you've seen what a cable, a charger cable looks like in the student's hands after one year, they're disgusting. Um, one of our, I brought, brought three of our technicians with us, um, but I remember watching Cindy over here with gloves on during the summer, Cloroxing cables and trying to get them clean and yuck, I'm just saying. And then finally, we did have a defined procedure for device turn-in, in other words, device inventory. So we do have an inventory management system called One to One Plus. I'll be getting to that in a little bit later. But we had a defined procedure of scanning the device in and making sure that it was registered as collected from the student so that the students weren't held accountable for missing devices that weren't actually missing. It also allowed us to run daily reports to show them who they had missed, who they need to be looking for, and if there were any duplicates for students. So once you've collected, there's some procedures that need to be done during the summer. One of them that we did our first two years was a plug and sync, like a plug up, sync, and wipe of the devices. Um, I just want to kind of show you what that looks like, and you'll see why in a second. So first you'll see Jonathan, one of our technicians, he's got the iPads in a crate, and they're charging side up, and he's plugging them into a sync station, but wait, we didn't tell our coaches how to collect. So now he's got to turn them all over. And I'm going to spare you the video length. It's 40 extra seconds. Not a big deal, right? It's 40 seconds, not even a minute. But when you do that times 950 crates, that's a couple days' work. And our warehouse just happens to not be conditioned, and we live in the south. Um, so our warehouse can get in upwards of 100 and 115 degrees, and that's hot. So now he's done flipping the iPads over, and now we can go back to the other video and finish. But wait, wait, there's actually more. So we have several schools doing this. And this is just an example of how inconsistent our collection was. We've got some stylus piled on top at the top right. We've got them face down in the bottom right. Um, power button up in the bottom left. So it's just all over the place. And in the top left, you can barely see it, but we have upside down and right side up, just mix match. So some directions will help you a lot during the summer. So now can we talk about deployment? Yes, yes, we can. OK. All right. So deploying devices, again, we had to fix our collection during the summer. Um, and we learned a couple lessons, and we decided during distribution, we're going to give a few more directions to our elementary and middle. But we allow the tech coach to still take ownership, because solely if it just doesn't succeed, it's really on them. We're there to help. 
but it is their school, their population. All directions were school-based, so any documentation that was given out to the students was tailor-made for each school by their coach, and the district issued like a scaffold um, version of what, we, what parts of the message we needed to have come across. We decided this year that all devices will be assigned to each student so we don't do a cart model anymore. Um, each student, grades one through eight, has the device assigned to them in our JSS, or JAMP per server, as it's called. Um, so that way, when we're e-sparking and doing some other things, finding those devices and which students on there really helps. Also, we've developed a set of what we call essential lessons that we go through every year. Those essential lessons include things like um, safe use of the internet, proper care and maintenance of the device, how to store it, how it should go in your backpack, how to carry and how not to carry your iPad. And we go through the same lesson every year, even though it's the same message, but that way we keep that consistent consistency with our students. Um, and all the documentation, just a little side note that we're gonna talk about today is available on our website. Um, and it's, if you just Google Clover School District, South Carolina, you'll find our connected classroom. Um, and all of this stuff is up there because we are very transparent. Uh, we wanna make sure all of our parents know what their, what their students are being told. Um, so if you wanna check out what we've written, there's, it's completely open to anyone who wants to completely steal it and use it in their district. We don't care. <laughs> um, so let's talk about our high school distribution really quick. Because of the size of our high school, we are a one high school district, um, the technology department actually took over deployment. Um, because when you have 22,400 students, um, we deploy inside of the classroom by homeroom, and we do the entire building in one homeroom block, so that's 45 minutes. So again, the directions were tailored for their school. Their tech coach took care of those. Um, and the devices, again, are assigned to students. So we know who has what. And they go through a modified version of the essential lesson. So instead of how to store and carry your iPad, it's how to store and carry your MacBook, what your responsibilities are as far as your power cord and um, keeping the device charged and all that. But some things that we learned is make sure you have realistic assumptions and goals. This man right here is my great-grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half-wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. So, so yeah, so if you don't have your correct assumptions and goals, that's really what it feels like trying to deploy devices. Um, it's not really possible. Um, so we started by creating soft or service level agreements for all the different audiences we serve. Um, so this is what that looks like. Um, in our pre-K through eighth grade, we have a 24 hour turnaround for all broken, damaged, or inoperable devices. Um, for our high school, we have a same day turnaround. Um, that doesn't mean the device is always fixed or repaired, but it means that the student goes home with a device that may be a loaner. Um, but Shaki, our on-site technician, makes sure that they're well taken care of um, and are really supported as they come to her working station. And, and the way that we kind of make this work is we have a, the, the coaches at each school, they have a pink form that's a damaged device form and that gets filled out by them with the, with the um, appropriate information. It get, there's a section on it that's approved by the admin, so they make all the decisions on whether it's a, a, a accidental damage or intentional, and then that comes with the device in a crate through a courier system every day, and we have a um, dedicated technician 
um, Cindy, at, um, at our warehouse that works on the, um, the iOS devices. And then we have a dedicated technician, Shakia, at the high school that they come to her. And um, we... Um, we also make sure those folks have a backup. So Cindy yeah. is allowed and Shakia is allowed to take days off occasionally. Um, but we always make sure that their backup is in place. Like since they're both here, they've had secondary folks making sure that the devices and our SLAs are all still met. Um, and it seems, it's been pretty seamless. I think last year um, on the iOS side, we may have had 10 at the most devices not make it back within 24 hours. But every time that's happened, I've seen Cindy get in her car and drive it out there to make sure that it's in the student's hands. Um, same story with Shakia. She's got so many loaners to give out to the students as well. So they're going home with something. An another big undertaking was um, how do you deploy apps? Um, we came up with a, um, with a Google form that the schools fill out and I have access to that. So whenever a free app is requested, it comes through that and I see it immediately. And usually 24 hours, we get it scoped mm -hmm. to self-service. The, the app store is blocked on our student iPads. With the MacBooks, we decided this year to um, take away admin rights. So um, software updates, they all have to come through our one-to-one -one ticket system. And me and John, um, one of us, usually take care of that. Um, paid apps, there's a paid app form that all the coaches have access to. And that gets approved by the um, administrator at the school too because those funds come through BPP and once that gets approved from an admin, it gets emailed to me and same, same deal with the free apps. I usually 24-hour um, turnaround on getting that scope to self-service. So something else to think about during deployment is new enrollment of students. Um, it's good to have a method of identifying new students and we thought our first year doing this that going into PowerSchool, our SIS, and pulling new student rosters, like enrolled less than seven days ago or whatever, would be an effective way of doing that. Then we realized 350 plus iPads later that our PowerSchool data was put in by real people who make real problems sometimes and some of the data hadn't been removed in a timely manner, hadn't been completely inputted in a timely manner, so we missed a lot of students and we did a lot of extra iPads. Did more extra than missed. Um, this year we actually used our product One to One Plus to, um, which marries with PowerSchool, to identify devices or to identify students who had no device assigned to them. Um, it was just a nightly report that was run and was set up waiting for us in the morning, um, which Cindy and team um, took that list each day and made those devices and were sent out in the courier system. Um, I do stress to all of our coaches and users in general, one work order equals one repair. So at the beginning of the year, our coaches are quick to say, I need these five iPads right now for this special need, and they'll put five iPad requests in one work order. Well, going through those work orders, um, these guys might find out that the four were really easy to make and the one that they needed in that same request is going to take a day or two. Guess what? One might get missed. So one work order, equal, one work order equals one repair. Um, that also helps us keep a ticket history of each device. We can see when it was set up because of the work order. We can see who it was assigned to. When we look into that user, we can see that ticket to find that device as well. So all, all those different pieces are related together. And inventory management is key in this whole process. When you're collecting, when you're distributing, knowing what you have and knowing that you have it is, is key to knowing what you're missing. So you can't run an inventory report during the middle of device collection or distribution and see what didn't leave the warehouse or what didn't make it back if you just don't know what you have. So when devices come back broken and are gonna be decommissioned, removing them from inventory, making sure they're not assigned to the student when they leave our warehouse as a new device, making sure that this coach knows, assign this to the student, don't leave it assigned to Cindy who made the device because then she's got 37 iPads assigned to her and these students don't, which makes targeting for other app requests even more difficult. So what did we learn?
Communication is key. We are a very open district. We post all of our documentation online. Um, we are constantly communicating through our director of instructional technology to our coaches and principals and making sure that all stakeholders, parents included and students, are all in the loop and know of any upcoming changes, whether it's changes in our fee system, changes in the expectations of insurance, changes, changes in the ways we handle cables, um, for getting a new case on the device, make sure the teachers know so they can plan their work classroom workflows a little differently. Um, we make sure every stakeholder is in the loop. And then we set realistic goals. So I know my team. My team knows each other. And we know what our capabilities are. Um, but being the director, I do like to try to push them to realize what I see their potential is. So each summer it gets harder and harder. Um, but I think it's building us a very effective team. And one thing that I've learned is how to adapt a mistake into, into a success. So what we've learned from that is always have a backup plan and don't let your ambitions get the, get the best of you. So for example, one of our backup plans, the first year we, or first and second year actually, that we rolled out MacBooks to our high school, um, we were using our, we were binding to Active Directory and we had forgotten that we still have home directories assigned. And there was one checkbox in the permissions for that folder, for the master folder that had all those um, home directories that was checked and shouldn't have been and restricted all those students' access. Well, if you're mapping home directories and the LDAP bound MacBook and they log in and the permissions are wrong, it will deny them login access. So all 600, I'm looking to our high school person for the numbers, all 600 students could not log in during that 45 minute homeroom. Now, I have my network engineer, who is also named Andy, um, on call for that deployment, dug into those permissions, had it fixed within the 45 minutes. Unfortunately, we had to have a, have a second home room to finish the deployment, but we were able to identify the problem, create a backup plan, and design that solution. Um, also, I mentioned earlier population growth and how to plan for that. Um, this year, Clover grew by 315 students the last 10 days before school started. Just everybody moved into Clover and registered their kids. So how do you plan for that? I mentioned earlier having a nightly report with our one-to-one -one plus software. I mentioned building 350 um, iPads the year before as PowerSchool was telling us to do. But these students didn't show up to the last second. So thinking this might happen, we built I, we built, they built, 400 iPads, had them created and stacked. We'd gone through the whites, they had gone through the white screens. Um, and had everything done except assigning the user and downloading those user-specific apps. So when we got that boom of students, it was about three, four hours on a Saturday, a couple of us were in there, just knocking through those devices, getting names assigned, and putting the little student labels on them. So it was super easy at that point and not nearly as stressful in years past. Also, some things we learned was getting the coaches defined directions on device collection and distribution. So we've created a district scaffold plan. And I know this is kind of tiny, um, but again, I can put this on our website for your reference, but it's photos of exactly what we expect in our crates, how we expect the iPads to be orientated, how many go in each crate, how you label, even the crates are color coded by school, how you label the grade level, the teacher name, homeroom, et cetera, and then how to identify damages, broken screen, buttons not working, whatever, um, and the prioritization of those. So finally, one thing we also learned is about risk, there's no reward. We've taken a lot of risks in the way we do our programs. We've jumped in and really upgraded our Jamp Pro server maybe sooner than we should to get those new features. Um, but we, again, are a district of risk takers. So with all of that said, I think it's time for a couple of questions. But before we get to that, I want to introduce the rest of our team. So you've met myself and Andy. But also with us today, we've got Shaquille Walker. We've got Cindy Sims. And then the last one, John McCarter. Um, all five of us are here for questions. Um, so I invite you to step up to the microphone and we're here for you. Hey, thank you. 
Uh, we have time for Q&A, so uh, if you do have a question, please head over here to the microphone and we can answer a few of those. Philosophically, um, I noticed that a lot of schools that are doing one-to-one -one do iPads for K through, you know, six, and then they go to MacBook Airs for the higher education. I work for Iowa State University, and we have a one-to-one -one currently with our uh, College of Vet Med students, and they're using Lenovo's because of the uh, ability to write. If I were going to do a one-to-one -one with them, I'd want to go iPad. I'm curious, why the division, why the split? Why not just continue with iPads all the way through? All right, so that's actually from one of my other presentations that oh. I normally do at ed tech conferences, but I have, I have your answer right here. <laughs> okay. So in our first year of implementation, so our pre-pilot year, if you want to call it, we bought Chromebooks, PCs, iPads, MacBooks, everything, and we put them in students' hands, we put them in parents' hands. And we said, you know, tell us, here's some tasks, some generic tasks. Create a document. I didn't say use Word. I didn't say use Pages. Give me a document. Create a presentation. And it needs to have the following three items in it, stuff like that. And we let the kids, with, with no instruction, do. And we saw that our little babies in pre-K all the way up through eighth grade really excelled on the iPad. And it was a safer space. It was something that we could kind of lock down and control and keep them directed. And this was pre-Apple Classroom. We really hadn't dabbled in Casper Focus either at the time. Um, but when we got to the high school level, the kids really said, you know, I need that work-ready, career-ready thing. Give me a PC. Got to have it. So we're going to treat you like we did the rest of our population. Here's your Chromebook, your PC, and your MacBook. Do. And basically, the, 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 you could not distinguish a difference between the products for those use cases in a world of BYOD in the workplace. So they definitely threw the iPad out soon because they didn't want the full keyboard and desktop experience. Um, so in the end, we decided at the superintendent level all the way through our school board, who supports us very well, um, that the most appropriate thing to do would be to create an Apple ecosystem throughout our entire district and keep them on that same platform. But during our instruction, we don't teach pages. We teach word processing. We don't teach um, numbers. We teach workbooks, stuff like that. So we keep it very device agnostic. And I, I'd like to add that we, we, at each middle school, we have an iMac lab. So once they get to that middle school level and they're about to go into the, the high school, they do get to experience the They have the a lot of exposure, yeah. Before they get get that as their main device. Do we have any more questions from the audience? This is my favorite part of the presentation, so please don't feel shy about questions. Yeah. So that. do you collect every device every summer, or do they get to take them home during the summer? That question comes up a lot within our population, too. Um, we do collect every single summer um, because we do want to make sure that we've got an accurate inventory. Um, that the kids actually come back with the device. Um, and then we have a chance to triage and repair and replace anything that needs to be done over the summer. So there might be some kids that are afraid of turning in their broken device because it still functions, but it's covered under insurance. They're just afraid to use their insurance. We're going to identify that during the summer and they're getting a new device when they come back. So it's really for that. Now, now the other side of that coin, our AP classes at our high school, um, some of our summer programs will have a special subset of devices assigned to that program. So for those summer programs, yes. And I will, I will say that um, as, as in, in um, response to the wiping, the first couple years, there were reasons why we had to wipe, like new features that we couldn't take advantage of unless we wiped, um, things like that. Or um, if um, every, we have a, um, we have a yearly, um, certain grade levels get new devices, so obviously, I mean, that's not really a wipe, but they get a new, a, a totally different device, so it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, we're on but a three-year refresh cycle. Th this summer was actually one of the first summers, I think, where we didn't wipe that many at all. Um, we didn't touch our collected third grade or fourth grade or our seventh grade and sixth grade. So all third graders coming in this coming school year got new iPads, all sixth graders coming in this school year got new iPads, all ninth graders got new MacBooks, and that's the same refresh cycle. They keep those devices for three years, three years, and then the MacBook for four years. Yeah. 
Yes. So how do you deal with uh, device misuse? Do you charge fees, fines, and then how do you deal with um, free and reduced lunch students? Sure. And how do you deal with parents who just say, I don't want my Not student for me. taking this because I don't want to pay any fines? Yep. So I will start with misuse and we'll end on fines. So let me forget fines. Um, <laughs> So for misuse, it's really, we've, we've developed a district level scaffold for discipline. So if the misuse is truly like I'm going to bad websites or I'm a MacBook user, I'm downloading VPNs, there's a method, and I might throw this at Shakia for a little bit of add-in if you want. Um, but for VPNs, we're, we're, we're fixing the device and then referring them to an assistant principal. Is that? Yes, they're referred to the principal. After they go to the principal, um, they either go to ISS or they may have lunch detention. After a certain amount of times, they would then, um, they may not have a device for like, may not be able to take their device home for seven days or either 14 days. And then after the fifth violation, it's permanent day user. But if you notice, she didn't say we take the devices away from the students. So that's another district directive is if we're truly one to one, um, we don't remove the device from the student ever. Um, we may put them in ISS or something like that where there's very limited interaction, but if it's truly an instructional tool, you're not gonna go take a kid's notebook away and their pencil. Um, as far as fees go, free and reduced lunch, um, I'm not gonna pay, you can't make me. That's true, we're public ed, we can't make you. So we, we encourage our parents to communicate with their, their students' administrators. We have a waiver form that says, hey, our t district technology fee is kinda high, it's 50 bucks a year. Um, but if you really break it down, 10 months in a school year, it's $5 a month. So let's put you on a payment plan. Can you do that? You still can't pay. I understand your situation. I'm going to waive your fee. Principal signs off. It's waived. Um, we have some other external funding sources that help keep our self-service insurance fund um, inflated enough to cover those. So we have not seen a problem with running out of repair money, if you will, for that Answer you? And we do very similar things yeah. for our Chromebooks. We actually charge students on first, second, third offenses if he keeps increasing the amount of fee or the fine. For our iPads, we don't charge anything. You know, if a kid breaks the screen, I just repair it. Gotcha. We, um, we do have, if uh, Andy mentioned our pink form or our damage form earlier, there's three classifications of damage accidental, intentional, intentional slash malicious and negligence. So if anything is not checked accidental, um, if it's the other two, there's a fee schedule that we have at our warehouse that we send a fee form back with the repaired device and they are permanent day users till that fee balance is at zero. We have another question? Yes. Um, what model do you use? What, which? iPad model and how do you repair them? That's what I'm wondering. I, I, I thought it, they cannot be repaired. And um, how big is the fault rate or loss rate? Okay, so yeah, we do not repair our own devices in-house. Um, for the iPad 4s, which we still have some in circulation, it'd be our grades five and eight, um, we have a third-party repair company that takes the devices off-site. I don't ask where they get the screens from, I just know they work. Um, and then they come back to us. Um, I know one of our Apple representatives is in the back, just earmuffs for a second, Lance. Um, to our iPad Air 2s, which will be our fourth and seventh grade, and our the iPad, whatever it's called now, is our grades three and six, um, are, are sent to Apple under Apple Care Plus. So we pay them that fee that gets assigned to it, and they return that iPad that way. Uh, MacBooks, we also have two different third-party companies we kind of balance that load through, but we are in the process of becoming a self-service um, group with Apple, getting our folks certified to do the repairs ourselves. We just haven't got that far yet. Hi, I was uh, frantically typing notes as you guys were talking. Um, on the elementary middle collection, you said something about you were running daily reports during collection. Yes. That maybe I didn't understand correctly. Our, our work order system, one to one plus, um, integrates with both JSS or JAMP Pro. 
um, and our student information system. And the report that we wrote, so it's not like um, a built-in feature, but we wrote a report that basically says, find all students in, in our um, work order system that are new, that, that exist, that have no device assigned to them. Since all devices are assigned to a user in our JSS and our work order system, um, the list ends up being pretty easy to make and we just run it nightly and try to empty that list by the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, what I was wondering about was um, during collection. Oh, I got yeah. you. And I'll add the, the one to one also is, it's, is really um, good because it has an, an assi a device assigned to um, blank and it has a held by blank. So as it got checked in, the held by got, gets changed to our coach at each school Plus there's a um, turn in blank that says no or yes. So when they, when, as they're checking them in, they change the hell by user to them themselves. Because they're physically and, holding and, it. And, and, and then also, yes, it's turned in. So the report that Matt was talking about is, um, he, he obviously, he would also have a search in that that says that that turn in is no. And so we know, and, and we really didn't have, I mean that report, um, I mean, it was maybe one or two devices at each location that took a few days to come in. Most of them were on the first run, they got them turned in. But that, that, was, that was pretty much how that, that worked. Okay. Yeah, so we, that, our, our challenge is our, our teachers really want the kids to have devices like right up until right the, the last, last day of school, yep. So we have this narrow window. I, I of feel your pain. Literally like a four hour window to collect all these devices and it, it just gets Pretty crazy. So, do you guys do this several days prior, like even at the high school level? Or it's I think it was the day last day of school. Yeah, the last day. The high school is to the last day of school because students are taking exams. Right. So, as they right. finish their exams, the teachers send them down to to basically turn in that device. Okay. And that's also part of the reason why um, most of our technicians are actually at the high school helping with that with that collection. So that's part of the reason why the other schools, we rely on the coaches to, right. to really take ownership of, of the, the collection. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for the group? We've got one more. A couple more. Do you require the devices to go home? Do you allow them to be taken home? <laughs> and if you just allow them to be taken home, I assume then you have carts that they can charge their devices during the night as opposed to like sending cables and adapters home. Sure. So we do allow devices to go home. We do not require it. We ask that all teachers have an alternative um, assignment to send in lieu of a tech, um, high tech assignment. Um, on the same note as that, and you didn't ask this, but the answer is waiting. Um, all teachers are required to design a no internet option as well if you are a take home user because over 40% of our district doesn't have access to internet. So, which is odd for a one-to-one -one district, I know, but they, we have found methods of encapsulating lessons using Notability or something like that so they can still take those home. Um, forgot the second half of the question. <laughs> The uh, charging. Oh, uh, yes, so charging, yes. Schools. So each school has like a day user storage area that's usually run either by media center or a tech coach in the morning and afternoon. And in that, we use a variety of different charging methods. Um, one of our favorites is the Griffin Cube. It holds 10 iPads and has a little multi really short uh, multi dock. That's Griffin the name multi dock. Of yeah. Um, and those are stackable and use fairly low amount of power. At our high school, we've found some cabinets that. Um, aren't really uh, pretty, but they work. Um, but inside of them are just shelf after shelf after shelf with, with a giant power strip in the middle, and they close and lock up. So day users know to go and plug them in there. Yes. Uh, so when a device doesn't come back uh, in collection, um, what, what is your asset recovery process? We go, we go find you. <laughs> we, yeah, and who's, is it, is it IT that does it? Is it your administrative uh, so disciplinary staff? Kind of who's there, there, is, there is some grace period. Um, you know, you, you, we want it on this date, but you've got until um, to get it back to us. So at the high school, you want me to do this? You want to do this? 
At the high school, um, I send a list out to the administrators. I also block the computers um, in JSS, and um, the administrators uh, contact the parents and tell them that they need to get the devices in. Um, if it passes that grace period where we've got to have it back right now, um, we do turn that list over to our school resource officer and let them handle it that way. Um, iPads, we kind of do the same thing. We lock them down um, so they're completely useless if they hit Wi-Fi ever again. Um, as soon as they hit Wi-Fi, we're getting those GPS locations and we're sending those out to principals, tech coaches as well. Um, we haven't really had an issue with recovery of iPads, um, but when we do, we have a channel with our police department and we just put in stolen device tickets I'd, with them. I'd like to add with the um, high school too, um, it's just treated just like any other um, fine, like if they don't turn in a book. Um, seniors, they, um, they can't walk if they don't turn it in, so I don't think we've had a problem with them coming back. For the, um, so. I think we have time for two more questions. We'll go to these two here. I don't know where to begin. Um, so for the devices that you do wipe over the summer, when you do wipe the devices during the summer, how do you set them up for the incoming students? Well, now we don't wipe them during the summer. Not at all. Um, new devices for our third grade, our sixth grade, and our ninth grade, um, we do very little touching of the devices. Um, we'll go through the iPads, we'll go through the white screens, get the user assigned. Um, if you haven't found this yet for iPads, Google will help you, but there's a way you can use the camera adapter, the little uh, lightning to USB camera adapter, mm -hmm. plus Apple's brand of the Ethernet to USB adapter and a power cord and actually hardwire your iPads. That coupled with a, um, a few caching servers, you can download those, gotta have, we have our essential yeah, lessons and our, our essential apps are comp comprised of nine different apps. So all of those are kind of baked into the iPad as soon as we get them set up for the student. But really we assign the student, if that school allows email, we, we might go through the configuration of the email, let those apps bake onto the iPads and then turn them off. Okay, and then one question about the is it one-to-one -one software? Yes. Does that actually show in PowerSchool any information to the admin staff or teachers? It is a read only from PowerSchool currently. Okay. So it will let you assign, there's like several custom fields in one-to-one -one plus that you can have. I want this field X, Y, Z, whatever field you could pull in a quick export and one-to-one -one plus can pull as well and those will populate on the device screen as well. But it doesn't write into... Does not write back currently. And that's more of a security thing. We just, um, we're kind of on the, the consultation team for, the, for that software. And like a lot of districts that I've talked to just leave my power school alone. Okay. We, we, you know, don't mess with my right. data. So that's been kind of a low priority request. So when student John turns in his iPad, does he get the same iPad the following yes. year? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. We have time for one final question back here. Oh, we have, sorry, we have to use the microphone. <laughs> um, so my question is around the one-to-one the -one, um, software for inventory. Uh, we have 26,000 iPads and 70 schools. Right. Um, and so inventory can, uh, as you can assume, you know, be an issue. We actually do not collect them at the end of each year. Students take them home over the summer, um, which is awesome because we just can't. Uh, mm -hmm. manage that collection and redistribution every year. Um, it seems to work for us, but I'm just curious as to how the one-to-one -one software as far as inventory management compares to what's inside of Jamf. We do a lot of device states, device statuses, um, notes inside of Jamf for that device, but what is the different information that you have with regards to the one-to-one -one software versus Jamf? Currently, a lot of it's really just historical data, like what tickets have been assigned with that device, who has it, who has had it, if it's gone through multiple users. Um, I can tell you there's an inventory management subsystem that's being developed right now in the software. So you would be able to create a list of what devices should be where by homeroom, and then give a barcoded list to that teacher, and they could do a quick inventory of their classroom and check off that those, those devices existed at the end of the school year, and then vice versa, at the beginning of the school year, check them back in. All right, we are at our time. Thank you so much to our speakers. We really appreciate uh, your time today.